of Code Pink, where I spent um, seven years working right before joining FOR to become our executive director. She is also a co-founder of Global Exchange um, and has worked and continues to work on anti-war and social justice issues around the world. Um, but I wanna get really kind of right into it. I could just talk to Medea about history and so on forever, but I really wanna kind of get into it because we're here to talk about Ukraine. Wait, and first I wanna say, Ariel, what a fan I am of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. I have been for many years. And when you became the executive director, it was such a thrill and it is such a thrill for me to work with you and the incredible team at FOR. So I just want to say uh, what a delight it is to be with you all and to be working together on issues that are so critical, like this war in Ukraine. Absolutely. And um, when 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 I left Code Pink to come over to FOR, Medea and I kind of hugged and cried and promised to continue working together. And I'm so glad that we still are, though I wish it was not on this Ukraine war because I wish this Ukraine war was not going on any longer. So uh, speaking of this war in Ukraine, let's start with when the war broke out and um, were you surprised? I had been writing about this issue with my colleague, Nicholas Davis. And right before the war broke out, uh, we wrote an article about what were the three likely scenarios. And one of them was a Russian invasion. One of them was that Ukraine would step up its escalation of the civil war in the Donbass. And the other was that the crisis would pass and they would continue to muddle on with this uh, low grade civil war. Uh, and we put the one about the Russia invasion as the least likely to happen uh, because of reasons that have come to pass, uh, how difficult it would be for Russia to try to either take over Ukraine or be uh, stuck fighting not just Ukraine, but with uh, the help of all of NATO and how bogged down they would get. Uh, and indeed, that is what has come to pass. Now, I didn't always know what NATO is and some of our audience may not know much about NATO. Um, you, however, have been working on NATO for many years. So and this is kind of a going back to the to you know what you and I were doing together um, at the start of this war and looking at the role that NATO has played. So if you could explain a bit of how NATO came to be, what NATO is, and then the role NATO has played, the US has played in the lead up to this um, very dangerous war. Well, it's funny, Ariel, because before this war, one of our biggest problems with educated the, the American public about NATO is people didn't know what NATO was. Uh, even when there was a NATO meeting in the US and Chicago, it was hard to get much interest in NATO. Uh, it uh, really did not get much play in the media. And I think it was much better known in Europe where its headquarters are than in the United States. Uh, but for a long time, Code Pink and me personally, I've been on the board of a group called No to NATO. And we've been working with our counterparts in Europe who have always uh, tried to uh, see what ways that we could diminish the power of NATO with our ultimate goal of seeing NATO dissolved. And every time I hear NATO is a defensive alliance, I want to tear my hair out because it's not <laughs> a defensive alliance. It is an offensive, dangerous alliance that has been searching since the fall of the Soviet Union for a new uh, raison d'etre, a new mission. And of course, in the name of NATO, is it supposed to be the North American Treaty Organization? Uh, but it is strayed far afield from NATO. And if you look also at its history, uh, separate right now from the issue of expansion to Russia's borders, it's a history of increasing aggression where it was supposed to be defending uh, Europe from uh, the Soviet Union, once the Soviet Union dissolved and its counterpart, the Warsaw Pact, which was its uh, counterpart in the Eastern Europe bloc, um, that dissolved. 
one would have thought NATO would have dissolved, but no, NATO searched for uh, other missions and therefore got involved in things like the bombing of Kosovo and then moved far afield to participate with the United States in the uh, invasion of, and occupation of Afghanistan. It didn't go in immediately in the uh, invasion of Iraq, but came in afterwards and participated in that occupation uh, and was very much in the forefront of the overthrowing of the Qaddafi government in Libya. And now, while it's uh, involved in this war in Ukraine and, and uh, a war against Russia, it really still is setting its sights on an even larger target, and that is China. So while the US has tried to, quote, pivot to Asia for years, but got bogged down first in the Middle East and now in Ukraine, uh, the US and NATO have both said that their biggest adversary is China. So I feel like NATO is a very dangerous organization and it's gotten even more dangerous with this invasion of Ukraine because uh, while it was uh, on the wane and people like Donald Trump at one point uh, said that it was a, um, a, an old fashioned organization that didn't have a new mission and uh, Emmanuel Macron from France was saying something similar, when Russia invaded Ukraine, it breathed new life into NATO. And um, so now you have NATO countries that are spending much more of their income on the military than they were, something that NATO was always pushing them to do. In fact, it was a goal of NATO uh, to increase the military spending of all the NATO countries to be 2% of their GDP, which is actually a lot, even though it might not sound like it. And the US has always far surpassed that, but most of Europe has never even uh, gotten to that quote goal uh, because the Europeans, unlike the United States, they have things like national healthcare systems and a free college education for their young people. And they said, we don't wanna be like the United States spending so much of our money on war. But now with this invasion of Ukraine, they found themselves pushed to uh, dramatically increase their military budgets uh, and to try to come together uh, as a unified entity uh, against, um, uh, against Russia. And we can talk later on about how united NATO and Europe uh, are at this point. But you also asked about the role of NATO in this war in Ukraine. And there, uh, in some ways, this was a war that was foretold many, many years ago. Because when you look at what happened with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the uh, reunification of East and West Germany, when NATO and the US particularly promised uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in, uh, that uh, NATO would not expand, quote, one inch eastward, this was something that was very well known throughout the region, throughout Russia. Uh, and yet the US violated that uh, with NATO expansions uh, closer and closer until it finally got right to Russia's border. And we think, as we explain in the book, um, War in Ukraine Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict, that if you don't think that was an important factor for setting the scene, how do you explain all of the US officials, including the US head of the CIA, William Burns, who was at one point stationed in Russia, then became ambassador. Uh, he, as well as so many others saying, uh-oh, you are uh, poking the tiger. You are creating a conflict. This is a red line that Russia will not tolerate. Um, this will end up in a very, very bad way. Um, why were there so many warnings about that? Well, we take those warnings seriously uh, and the US government should have taken those warnings seriously and it didn't and instead kept expanding and, and expanding. And then in 2008 promised Ukraine that they would be able to join NATO. And Ariel, this is something that was promised uh, by George Bush at the time against the will of Germany, France, Italy, who knew this was a very bad move. And that's why when they made the announcement, they didn't set a date. They just said at some time in the future, because there was already great division within NATO saying, this is, will not be a good thing. We should not do it. Now, 
this is again a, sort of about NATO, but broadening this this picture of this war. Um, the, the you know one of the biggest dangers of this war is that it will escalate to the use of nuclear weapons. If you could talk a bit about NATO's involvement with nuclear weapons, the U.S.'s stockpile of nuclear weapons, um, as well as Russia's. Well, yes, it's important to say that Russia actually is the largest uh, country of, uh, in terms of its nuclear weapons. But between the United States and Russia, they account for about 90% of the uh, world's nuclear weapons. And so any conflict that might bring the two, those two countries in direct uh, war is one that is extremely, extremely dangerous. And we have NATO and the United States having put nuclear weapons in five different countries in Europe, uh, something again that is quite provocative. Uh, and you see also US bases that uh, separate from NATO are surrounding uh, the, the uh, uh, Russia in terms of Europe with a new base in Poland being built mm -hmm. only 100 miles from uh, Russia's mm -hmm. border. Uh, so the issue okay. of nuclear weapons right. and uh, right. some either an accident or um, provoked or uh, on purpose, um, we'd be disastrous not only for the region, but the whole world. And it's been very scary to hear uh, Vladimir Putin talk about uh, the possible use of nuclear weapons. It's been very scary to hear uh, President Biden talk about the risk of nuclear Armageddon. Uh, and for that reason, I think there are uh, some communications between the US and Russia, uh, uh, the counterparts in the military to try to stop that from escalating. But you even hear somebody who is quite the hawk, uh, and that is the head of NATO, Jan Stoltenberg, who just last week was asked, what is his greatest fear about this conflict? And he said his greatest fear was that it would spin out of control. And if it got out of control, it could go horribly wrong. And by that, he was implying uh, the, the uh, possibility of a nuclear war. So I think it's um, extremely dangerous and that the American people should be more aware of this. Uh, and uh, this should be pushing us to be asking what are we doing aside from talking to the counterparts in Russia, what more could and should we be doing to stop this from escalating into a nuclear conflict? So speaking of, um, what, who is trying to stop this from escalating? Who is trying to end this war, get a permanent ceasefire? And uh, whether those are countries or individuals, and then we're going to get into what role the U.S. is playing and who is not. Well, first, let's make it clear that this was an unjustified invasion. Uh, we talk about the provocations, but it still doesn't justify what Russia has done and is doing. And the level of brutality, the level of, of suffering uh, that the Ukrainian people are uh, experiencing is just horrific. Uh, not only those who have been killed and wounded, but those who have had to flee the country by the millions, uh, and uh, those who are now suffering from the uh, latest tactics that the Russians are using of destroying the infrastructure, now suffering in the cold uh, without adequate access to water, electricity, and heat. Um, this is extremely barbaric, and we have to uh, put everything we're talking about in negotiations uh, in that context of a war that Russia should not have launched uh, and that um, uh, pressure must be put on Putin to go to the negotiating table. In the meantime, we have to look at what we can do. And here, you know, we have very little possibilities of putting pressure on Putin. Uh, we who live in the United States have to put pressure on our own government. And I don't think our own government has done nearly enough uh, to try to move this from the battlefield uh, to the negotiating table. Um, maybe if we have time later, uh, Ariel, we can talk more about uh, the US interference in the internal affairs in Ukraine um, that is another important piece of history to look at. Uh, but when you talk now about what are the possibilities of negotiations, we actually had the best possibility a month after the 
Russian invasion, when there were talks that were mediated by the head of Turkey, uh, Erdogan, who was uh, moving forward in a very positive way with representatives from Ukraine and from Russia. And they had a plan that was being put forward that Zelensky himself was talking to the people of Ukraine in the terms of saying, we wanted to join NATO, but it looks like it's just not going to be possible, uh, that Ukraine will have to be a neutral country, but we need uh, security guarantees from powerful countries in order to make that possible so that we would not be invaded again. Uh, and uh, there was talk about from Russia about pulling its troops out. Um, unfortunately, there was a visit then by uh, the head of the UK at that time, Boris Johnson, who said that the, uh, there was no reason to be negotiating with Russia, that the, quote, collective West uh, was in this for the long term with Ukraine uh, and would provide them with the wherewithal to actually win this. And um, the message we heard uh, about that same time from the Secretary of Defense from the United States, Lloyd Austin, uh, was that this was a time uh, when we had to weaken Russia. Uh, and so those kinds of sentiments that were uh, conveyed to uh, Zelensky uh, really made Zelensky change his position. Uh, and instead of talking about compromise, it has become a maximalist position of we want every inch of Ukraine back, including all of the Donbass and all of Crimea, where the Russians are now taking their own maximalist position, pretending that the referendums they had in the four areas of Ukraine now belong to Russia when Russia can't even military control uh, all of those areas. So you have these two opposite um, positions, but I think we have to understand those as negotiating positions because before uh, warring parties go to the table, they, they put out the positions that they would most want to achieve. Uh, but I think in this case, uh, there is a middle ground that can and must be achieved, and we have to push our leadership uh, to be the ones saying to Zelensky the exact same thing that the chairman of the, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, who is the number one uh, military advisor to the president, came out and said a few weeks ago, which was the Ukrainians have done an amazing job on the ground uh, pushing back the Russians, uh, but they are now at a stalemate and this war will not be won uh, on the battlefield. This is a time of winter when it's a good time to seize the moment and go to the negotiating table. This is not the message coming from President Biden himself or from the Secretary of State. It's coming, oddly enough, uh, from somebody who is inside the military. Uh, so we peacemakers, uh, have to make alliances with those in the military who understand this is not a winnable war on the battlefield and join forces to say, how do we move this to negotiations? So we're gonna talk soon, I'm gonna ask you soon about who is benefiting from this war and um, the amount of weapons and other um, military aid that the US has given to Ukraine. But first I wanna ask a question that I imagine a lot of the people on the call are thinking, um, wouldn't negotiations just be rewarding a bully, rewarding Putin um, and giving in to, to Putin um, who carried out an illegal invasion? And well, what would you say to that? You know, we've talked about the consequences and the horrific possibility of a nuclear war. Um, we also have to talk about the consequences of this war uh, outside of Ukraine in terms of the way that it's created so much uh, increase in hunger and food insecurity around the world because the massive amount of grain uh, that used to come from Ukraine and the grain and fertilizers that came from Russia and how this uh, war has led to shortages and increases in the price of uh, foods around the world, and also how the uh, sanctions on Russia have led to increased energy prices that are affecting people, particularly in Europe, who are uh, having to pay uh, horrific prices to heat their homes this winter, but it's also uh, contributing to inflation worldwide. 
And so uh, this is a conflict that has pushed the heads of state of countries all over the world to say, uh, we don't want to choose between Russia and Ukraine. We want to only choose one side, and that's the side of peace. Uh, and they're begging uh, with the parties involved in the conflict to find a resolution. So instead of re thinking about this of rewarding Putin, because there will be many things that Putin will not get rewards for. In fact, I would say he's already lost uh, this war. Uh, if, his, if his goal indeed was to put a pro-Russian government in the capital in Kyiv, that obviously didn't and is not going to happen. Uh, he uh, has been condemned by um, so many of uh, his, even his allies, but once again, they might condemn the invasion of Russia, but they want to see this war brought to an end quickly. Uh, and that's why so many of them around the world are pushing for these negotiations, are even putting forward uh, themselves or other uh, people like the Pope or the Secretary General of the UN uh, to come forward and uh, offer themselves as mediators. Uh, the other thing we have to recognize, you know, when we talk about the risk of nuclear war, uh, let's go back to 1962 and the Cuban Missile Crisis, when there was also that risk of nuclear war. And people could have said, well, you don't want to negotiate with Khrushchev because that's rewarding him for having put missiles 90 miles from our border. Uh, but no, John F. Kennedy and Khrushchev knew that the fate of the world was in their hands and that they had to talk to each other and they had to compromise. And indeed, even though it wasn't told to the American people at that time about the compromise that the United States made, um, the US made compromises as well. And uh, the uh, uh, one of the things that um, the JFK said afterwards that should be something that resonates very uh, loudly with us today is that he said, when you're in a confrontation with a nuclear power, never put them in the position where they have to choose between a humiliating uh, defeat and the use of a nuclear weapon. And that is the position that some want to put Vladimir Putin in. Uh, Biden seems to recognize that that is not a good position as well, since he himself has said, we need to offer Putin an off ramp. And that is what would happen at the negotiating table. So has the US been pushing at all for negotiations? What have we done to encourage negotiations, encourage an end to this war? And um, what's happening? What are the numbers? What are we looking at with um, weapons and other forms of military aid uh, given to Ukraine? And are these increasing, um, not just in number, but also in lethality? Well, let me go back to answer this question Please. on this issue of what happened uh, when the Minsk agreements were signed in 2015 to try to stop the civil war that was going on in the Donbass region. And I bring this up because that's when the world did come together. It was Ukraine, Russia with Germany, France, and then it was uh, uh, stamped by the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, to get monitors in, to give autonomy to those breakaway regions, uh, to have the head of state of Ukraine meet with the uh, breakaway leaders of, of the Donbass. And uh, just a week ago, there was a, um, uh, an article that the former head of Germany, Angela Merkel, uh, gave an interview. And in it, she uh, hearkened back to these Minsk Accords. And she said, this was really an agreement to buy time. And what Ukraine did and the West in buying time uh, was to arm uh, Ukraine and get Ukraine in a better position for a fight with Russia. Uh, she herself said, how could Putin ever um, uh, ever confide in, uh, in negotiations with the West uh, after what happened with the Minsk Accords. So this, I, I just want to explain for a minute please, to the people please. on here. It means that instead of when that accord was reached, everybody pitching in to make sure that it was implemented, what happened is that the U.S. started sending in uh, arms to Ukraine, weapons that at first under Obama were called non-lethal weapons, and then under Trump, 
uh, were lethal weapons. And they started training the Ukrainian military 10,000 at a time uh, each year. Uh, and so the Ukrainian military has been built up to be uh, one of the strongest in Europe. Uh, and this was not what the Minsk Accords was all about. It was supposed to be the opposite. Um, it was supposed to end the conflict. And then so you have right now the US, once the conflict started, pouring in even more massive amounts of money uh, for weapons. Uh, this is quite uh, a gargantuan amounts. Uh, just one tranche itself was $40 billion, 19 of which was for uh, weapons. Uh, it, aside from the weapons, we're subsidizing the Ukrainian government to the tune of $1.5 billion every month just to keep the government going. Um, but in terms of the weapons, uh, this is the greatest, um, uh, the greatest, uh, let's say, Christmas gift for the weapons companies. Um, not only are they getting massive, massive orders for weapons, but they have now changed the rules of the game so that they can get orders that are multi-year orders that don't have to be certified by Congress. Uh, they get no bid con uh, contracts, meaning they're guaranteed profits. Uh, and um, they are uh, making money not only from the US taxpayers, uh, massive uh, uh, money going to uh, weapons for Ukraine, but also uh, that increased money from Europe that we had talked about. Um, the US energy companies are also making a lot of money from this war. When the sanctions came on Europe, uh, European energy, it was US companies that wanted to quickly jump in uh, to replace them. And that is uh, the, the fossil fuel companies, the gas and the oil. Uh, and uh, the Europeans are complaining that the US is war profiteering, price gouging, uh, selling US energy at four times the price that Americans are paying for it. Um, so there is a lot of profiteering going on. In terms of all these weapons, we also have to ask, where are they going? There was a CBS documentary uh, that uh, uh, questioned um, where are all these weapons were going in the, and said that perhaps as many as 70% of those weapons were not making it to their uh, intended uh, fr uh, front lines in Ukraine, uh, but m much of that was being sold off on the black market. We know from the past, Ariel, what U.S. weapons flooding into Afghanistan, into Iraq, what they created, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and there is already evidence that, that mm -hmm. those weapons uh, many of them are going into the black market and now showing up in places in Africa, for example, in the hands of terrorist organizations. Um, there is a, a uh, call by the Republicans in Congress to do an audit of where all this money is going, uh, but the Democrats are trying to stop that from happening. But you can imagine when you are pouring in so much money, this is a, a and so many weapons, it is a disincentive for the Ukrainian government uh, to go for negotiations. Absolutely. Could you talk a bit about what's going on in Congress with, um, with this issue? And specifically, there, there was a letter from progressives. Um, what is the, the situation in Congress addressing this? Where are the peacemakers? So it's kind of topsy-turvy, Ariel, according to what one would think. Um, we, uh, Ariel and I, worked in Congress for many, many years, and our uh, best allies in Congress were people in the Progressive Caucus, and they were the ones that were working with us to try to stop uh, the a gargantuan Pentagon budget to cut it back, to try to stop wars. Uh, right now, um, it's some extreme uh, right-wing Republicans who are complaining about this war. Uh, and the Democrats, uh, when the Progressive Caucus tried to do something about it and got 30 of them to sign on to a very mild letter saying that in addition to all the help we were giving Ukraine, um, it was time to, uh, to push for negotiations. The backlash in their own party was so tremendous 
that something happened that I have never seen before. A letter that was signed, sealed, and delivered to Biden within 24 hours was withdrawn. Uh, the people who had their name on there were taking their name back, apologizing for having signed this. In fact, as far as I know, there's only one person from those 30 who, uh, uh, who had signed that uh, very mild letter um, who has defended the letter. And that is the Congressman from California, Ro Khanna, who went on CNN and said, well, of course, it's a very rational letter. We should be calling for negotiations. Uh, and he got a lot of support for standing up for that. Uh, it is unfortunate that so many of the other Democrats caved. And then that when the $40 billion was voted on, not one Democrat questioned it. Yet there were 57 Republicans in the House and 11 in the Senate who did question it. Uh, and will probably question the next round of $38 million, uh, billion dollars, uh, that will be voted on any day now. So it's quite topsy-turvy when you get uh, the right wing of the Republican Party together with people like Tucker Carlson and Fox News and people like Donald Trump uh, saying uh, it's time for negotiations. And yet our own allies in the Democratic Party have been cowed and silenced. So th this, as we were having this conversation, um, as you were talking about this with, with progressives, I was reminded, um, I was thinking back to FOR's founding um, with the First World War, and we founded Fellowship of Reconciliation to support conscientious objectors who were refusing to serve in um, that first war. And then we also supported conscientious objectors to World War II, long called the uh, Justified Great War. Um, and those conscientious objectors at that time, back in 1914 in Europe and then 1915 here, um, were all faith-based. They were conscientious objectors uh, from principle of faith. And Jane Addams, who uh, later won the Nobel Prize, who was, I believe, the first um, American woman to win the Nobel Prize at the time, uh, dealt with a lot of backlash uh, for her opposition to World War I and being a pacifist. And it, it is often unpopular. And um, as everybody in Congress was, you know, uh, are voting for more weapons, more money for this war. Um, and as we risk nuclear annihilation, you and I, Medea, um, we, were, we were meeting at your house and, and you said to me, you know, I think the faith community is an avenue um, for us to pursue a, a path of peace. And so if you wanna comment a little bit on um, how the initiative that we're working on together, the Christmas truce came about and then I'm gonna invite uh, my colleague, Bill McGarvey on, who um, has been working tirelessly um, on this with us and, and uh, we'll give a little background uh, through a video um, that he produced. Yeah, let me say, I see from the comments uh, and, and people that I respect very much um, that there are differences of opinion on interpretation. And I totally understand that and appreciate that and uh, do not expect that everybody um, would see eye to eye on the role of the United States in some of these issues. Uh, what happened during Maidan? Was it a coup or was it a popular uprising? Uh, I say it was a popular uprising that led to a coup, um, but uh, a lot of differences of opinion that are very legitimate. And I think we should all respect those differences of opinion. But I think there comes a point where we all have to recognize that the more this war goes on, uh, well, two things, that there is not going to be a victory a, on the battlefield. You know, we've heard for 20 years in Afghanistan that victory was around the corner. Uh, the strongest military in the world, the U.S., fighting against this ragtag army of the Taliban. Uh, and yet here we are 20 years later, uh, and the Taliban is the one that won. Um, the, the victory is not around the corner. Russia is a formidable enemy. Uh, and the more this drags on, the more the Ukrainian people are going to suffer and the entire world community is going to suffer. Uh, and uh, that we have to uh, all come together despite the differences in how we interpret and place the blame, uh, come together to say, how can this end? And that's where we are now. And that's why uh, when Ariel, you and I met, 
we were talking about how important it was to move this in the US away from partisan politics, because when there's a Democrat in the White House, it's very hard to get Democrats in Congress uh, to stand up to the policies of a Democratic president. Um, and yet, uh, here we are in a situation where um, we have to take this out of the realm of party politics and put it into the realm of morality. And in the realm of morality, it's what can we do uh, to stop the harm, to stop the killing, to stop the suffering, to end this as quickly as possible? Uh, how the negotiations would take place? What would be the line drawn on Donbass? When can there be internationally supervised elections? All of those things have to be determined, but not by us. That will be determined by Ukraine and by Russia. On another level, yes, the US and Russia have to talk about other things like arms control, like, uh, um, like issues about um, uh, US bases, issues around arms control. Um, but uh, our, our, as, as uh, residents of this country uh, and as people of faith, our job is to say, how can we put the pressure on our president so that he publicly starts calling for negotiations and starts uh, pushing for those and talks directly to uh, Putin and that Anthony Blinken talks directly to uh, Lavrov uh, and this moves forward. So the idea of getting people from the faith-based community was a dream that we had. And I remember, Ariel, when we first talked about it, we said, well, we need a goal. What should our goal be? And we said, well, maybe 100. Because we, we knew this would not be easy because people don't want to stick their necks out into uh, this political terrain uh, that, is so, uh, that is so full of conflict. Uh, and yet in just these few weeks, we have now, um, is it about a thousand who have signed on? It's well over a thousand. Well um, over a thousand. Bring my colleague, uh, Bill on, who has been working on this, uh, working on this with us from day one. And uh, I know it's over 1100. Are we up to 1200 yet, Bill, if you know? As the road today was like 1150, I believe. So getting close. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been gaining a lot. Well, that is fantastic. And maybe Bill, you know, you've been a, a big part of this. Um, has this in, been inspirational to you? Well, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've worked in this interfaith space a long time, and it's been amazing to see how many folks really caught onto this so quickly um, and really found common ground, which is really important that, as you said, beyond partisan politics, there is so much, especially people from faith communities, from every faith community, from Jewish, Muslim, Christian to Orthodox Christians uh, that we've had a number of Orthodox bishops sign on. Uh, so we've been very thrilled. And then a Buddhist tradition, um, Hindu tradition, Sikh tradition. So it's been it's been really inspiring to see, much like the original 1914 sort of, we're asking for a little bit of a, a miraculous sort of imagination to be employed here. So it's been interesting to see folks be able to do that, to be able to jump on and second that notion, so to speak. Yeah, so I don't know if I'm, we've been sending out lots of emails ourselves um, on this Christmas truce and posting it on lots of social media places, but I don't know if everyone has uh, seen or knows even what happened in 1914 and, and the Christmas that heard us um, to begin this initiative from faith leaders. And so, Bill, if you would show that video. Absolutely. I'm going to show everybody just the one minute short because we're going to get to the questions. There's some great questions here and we're going to bring some folks on. So this is the one minute version. There's a longer three minute version that I'll put in the chat that is more context. But this is the one minute statement that over 1,100 faith leaders have signed and you'll recognize some of the faces. So hopefully here we go. Can you see that? As people of faith and conscience, believing in the sanctity of all life on this planet, we call for a Christmas truce for Christmas truce for a Christmas truce in Ukraine. The spirit of the truce that occurred in 1914 during the First World War. We urge our government to take a leadership role in ending the war in Ukraine by calling for a ceasefire and negotiated settlement. We pray they do this before more people are killed and wounded. And millions more are displaced from their homes. Before the growing crisis in global hunger and poverty worsens. And before the conflict results in a nuclear war that could devastate the world's ecosystems and annihilate. And annihilate 
and annihilate all of God's all of God's all of God's creation 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 thank you mm-hmm. so um Bill if I can turn it over to you for our first I've, question either about oh, the got the a Bruce lot of great questions that, background I think there's a lot there's a lot of good stuff. I think we were going to try to get Stephen Zunez. We're very honored to have him on board. I know he's been a, a colleague and somebody who's worked with um, Medea before, and he has a question, a number of questions. But uh, Stephen, if you're there, we I had sort of I'll want to see if you wanted to unmute yourself. Sure, quickly. sure. I, I, I yeah. First of all, thank you, Medea, um, and for everything uh, as usual. Uh, yeah, I, as you know, I've, I've just been a huge fan of you, yours. You know, for I guess going on thirty years at least now. Um, yeah, I just want to uh, to reinforce one of your points, you know, about saying, oh, we can't negotiate because that's compromising with aggression or whatever. But let's remember that the United States is the only country in the world that has formally recognized Israel's illegal annexation of the Golan region of Syria and Morocco's annexation of the entire nation of Western Sahara. We're also insisting that the Palestine Authority uh, negotiate with Israel to give up huge swaths of the West Bank to these legal settlements, even though that we're talking about only, you know, 28 percent of historic Palestine. So, you know, for the United States to supposedly be, say we can't negotiate on principle is, is, is completely misleading. And I, and I think it's important to emphasize uh, that uh, uh, there is not principle in, in, involved involved here in the, in the refusal to uh, negotiate. Um, you, you somewhat addressed, uh, addressed this already, but I think uh, and, and you're, I, have, I have no 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 real um, strong objections to anything that you you said today. But I do just want to emphasize that uh, you based on some things I saw in your, read in your book and 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 everything that I I, I do think that the um, I, I I just I I, I am yeah you know, just my own just to be go on record that I really think it's important to not deny agency to the Ukrainians even when they make bad uh, decisions or Eastern Europeans in general. I mean the vast majority of Eastern Europeans wanted to be part of NATO. If I was an Eastern European, I would oppose it by being a minority, you know, so I don't think it's just the uh, U.S. kind of imposing this kind of Eastern expansion. Uh, of course, we were happy to sell them weapons and everything else. But 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 similarly, I, would, I and, and similarly, uh, in terms of the, the Maidan uprising, you know, I, I yeah, the, the, the fascist elements, the violent elements were a tiny percentage. I mean, the equivalent of the black bloc you know, had some of the big demonstrations we've had. And um, that it was overwhelmingly nonviolent, and these were these were, were were liberals, even some leftist, you know, other other pro-European uh, 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 elements who are really tired of, of uh, uh, Yanukovych's uh, uh, incredible corruption, increasing authoritarianism. Um, so again, th- th- these are, these are a few areas where I do take issue with with, with what, what 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 was in your book, but but by and large, just let me say that I I, I greatly appreciate, as I always have, your your being so out out in front and so prolific, and your your support for peace. Well, thank you, Stephen. I look forward to coming out there and having a, a debate in person, and I so appreciate all the work that you do on this and so many other issues. Uh, but I'm glad to see that, you know, in the end, we come together on this. And Ariel, you brought up a point that we didn't really talk about, but Stephen, I know it's very uh, dear to your heart, which is the role of resistors. And uh, I think while we talk about what we can do to push our government, we should also be talking about what we can do to support the resistors. And in uh, Russia, there is a Um, a huge number of people who refuse to fight in this war, uh, who have left in large numbers because they won't fight, uh, who are part of an international underground movement that's trying to find them uh, jobs, places to live, uh, and that it's important. There's a smaller but also important Ukraine group of resistors uh, and uh, pacifists and um, you know, that is another area where I think FOR has really excelled. And maybe, Ariel, you have more information uh, what the international FOR is doing on that front. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, Fellowship of Reconciliation formed to support conscientious objectors to World War One at the time and all wars since. And... Um, International FOR, we refer to them as I4, uh, works at the UN to support conscientious objectors and specifically at this time to support Russian, Belarusian, and Ukrainian conscientious objectors 
uh, we, we talk about all of these military solutions, um, but here is an opportunity for creative nonviolence uh, to, to help bring about a peaceful end um, to this war. Bill, if you wanna um, either add to that or uh, bring in another question. I'm going to, I was gonna bring another question. I'm just putting, thank you. I'm putting this into the chat. Uh, we got a good question here from Susan Dubois. Uh, I apologize, I'm just getting up to it. We've got a number of good questions to try to get to. Have the atrocities that were discovered in Buka and elsewhere made Ukraine's early 2022 negotiating position obsolete? Well, no, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, there are uh, horrific atrocities um, that continue and war itself is an atrocity, um, but that's even more of the reason to find a, a, a way to stop it. Um, I think that we have to uh, recognize that um, the more the war drags on, the more atrocities there will be. Um, and um, I don't think that is what changed Ukrainians' position. I think what changed Ukrainian position was indeed uh, the push from uh, the, uh, the West and particularly uh, the US and the UK. Uh, because we should make it clear that there are divisions in Europe around this. Um, we haven't talked about that yet, but I think it's important to recognize um, that the, the French, the German, the Italians, uh, they have been much more uh, forward uh, pushing in terms of negotiation, uh, in terms of keeping a, uh, a line of communication open with Putin, uh, even uh, Ma Macron, when he came to visit uh, Biden at the White House, while what was portrayed in the U.S. media was uh, seemed to be a kind of love fest that they were on the same page, uh, what he said afterwards uh, was something very different. Macron said that we have to recognize the legitimate security interests of Russia uh, that must be addressed. Uh, so I think um, looking at uh, the the European position uh, where they are the ones that are uh, being more affected by this war than we here in the United States are. And to hear uh, some of those leaders uh, pushing for negotiations is uh, the same page that we should be on. That's so it. before we go to a next question, because I see we're coming up on the top of the hour and there is so much more we could talk about. We uh, could go into US meddling in Ukraine. We could go into a variety of different countries' positions um, on this uh, and, and on and on and on. Um, I want to, you're doing a series of online and in-person talks. Um, so for folks that want to learn more and continue this discussion, when's the next one? And uh, where's the website so folks can see if you're coming to their town um, and who do they contact if they want to organize um, a book talk. We did put the link for your book in. We will be carrying it in, in the um, FOR store, uh, but right now it's available through Code Pink. So Medea, if you would just give a little overview of that before we go back to questions. Yeah, I mean, when I looked at what was happening around the world, and I see now there are large demonstrations in Europe against this war in many, many different countries. And it's often led by labor unions. There are environmental groups that recognize how disastrous this war is for the environment. Uh, and yet here in the United States, it's been very hard. And I think part of that is the Democratic president. Part of it is uh, the... Uh, the narrative from the mainstream media, uh, and part of it is just exhaustion or a lack of the same kind of tradition in the United States uh, for getting out in the streets on a regular basis like they have in Europe. But it re realized to me that it was important to just get out and, um, and be educating and mobilizing people. And that's why I've been on this uh, 50 city book tour going all around the country, talking to university students and community groups and faith-based groups and uh, all kinds of people um, to try to get them on board to get active. And getting active can be so many different things. It can be making one call to your member of Congress saying out, saying, come out for the Christmas truce. Uh, it could be um, something uh, more in depth, like 
uh, getting a copy of the book or a few copies and passing them out to your relatives or uh, friends and, and of course reading it yourself so you could have more in-depth discussions. Uh, house parties. Um, we have an 18 minute video and it would be great if we put the link in the in the chat there. Um, it's codepink.org, a uh, Ukraine uh, book video. And um, uh, that's a great video to show in, in people's homes. Uh, we have people who are going out to their farmers markets with a sign saying, let's talk about Ukraine and starting up these great discussions where they're getting people to sign on to a petition for the Christmas truce. Um, we do have uh, uh, calls of weeks of action. Uh, there's a call for demonstrations on January 14th, Martin Luther King Day. Uh, women around the world are talking about organizing for March 8th, International Women's Day, a call for women to say no to war. Uh, and um, we also uh, have um, opportunities for people to contact their media and ask them to get different voices on the media, also sample op-eds that they can introduce and letters to the editor. So there are two places to go. One is peaceinukraine.org and the other is Code Pink. And on the Code Pink website, uh, on the Code Pink uh, book tour, you can see um, where I've been and I'm uh, starting up the book tour again in mid-January and happy to come to your communities. If you'd like to invite me, you can write to maha, M-A-H-A at codepink.org and I'll put that in the chat. Great. Great. I would, I, to you, Bill. Okay, I wish we had more. To, there's so many good conversations. And by the way, thank you, Stephen Zinez, for responding very respectfully to some disagreements in the chat. So I really appreciate that. And thank you for keeping our disagreements as civil as they are. Elaine McCarthy had a couple of really great questions that one of them I can answer myself. Have we, has there been an attempt to get religious leaders in Ukraine to support the Christmas truce? We have, it, it's difficult as you can imagine to get a hold of Orthodox church leaders. We've gotten four, but they're in the, they're American based Orthodox. So it is, it is a thorny issue and it has not been successful to get folks there. We just don't have it. And a I just want to Add to that real quickly yeah, because we at uh, FOR one of the main issues that we're going to be addressing in 2023 is Christian nationalism, and this war in Ukraine is also a product of and deeply entangled with Christian nationalism uh, on on both sides in this case, and we've seen a break in um, people that are of the same faith, of the same Orthodox Christian faith. Um, that there's long been rifts, but um, those rifts are widening greatly. And that's one of the reasons as well, calling for this Christmas truce. Ukraine has moved their celebration of Christmas uh, to the Roman calendar uh, to differentiate it from Russia. And Putin has brought in the um, Russian Orthodox Church. And on the other hand, uh, Vladimir Zelensky has proposed that he would like to ban uh, the entire Russian Orthodox religion from Ukraine, a, a terrible, um, dangerous, dangerous move to take. So yeah, so just to bring that kind of into the picture as as well. Um, and sorry to, to kind of grab that last question that way. <laughs> Ruby Sinreich just commented, thank you for bringing out Christian nationalism. For anybody, it is the end of the year and we, we're obviously running out of time, but we that is the focus of FORs real campaign moving forward and really the christmas truce is meant to move into that is to really call into question and, and to really you know combat what is a christian nationalism uh in the united states certainly so uh i guess really just just to we'll really take quickly, one more question Medea, as long as you have a few more minutes you have a minute sure, sure. uh i think eli mccarthy uh, mccarthy had a, a comment uh promoting nonviolent resistance in ukraine is a key piece of the shift uh, to shift the sources of power and move for, toward conditions for negotiations. Do you have any thoughts about uh, nonviolent resistance in Ukraine, Medea, or anything that he's written an article here as well? Uh, well, yes. I mean, we work very closely with um, uh, the Ukrainian pacifist groups, and they have all kinds of ideas for shifting this to nonviolent resistance. But um, uh, and, and you know that is is something we should definitely be supporting, and we saw a lot of that happening in Ukraine before uh, the it, it turned into a full fledged military conflict. Um, so I think the Ukrainians know well how to do nonviolent resistance. Uh, the question is really more uh, how can we move from uh, 
this uh, never es ever escalating uh, intensity of battle where the Ukrainian government wants just more and more uh, high powered weapons uh, that are moving us into a direct conflict with Russia because those weapons could reach Russia uh, and instead moving into the peace talks and nonviolent resistance. And I believe some of those weapons have been reaching Russia. That Ukrainian, uh, that Ukraine has been uh, flying drones deep into Russian territory and uh, carrying out bombings there. Yeah, that, that we have so many good questions, but I know we have limited time, and I don't want to take up any. So I thank you so much for all the questions, and we apologize we can't get to all of them. But please. And Sorry, okay. yeah. Oh, I was going to say, Medea, if you have final thoughts, and I know well, you've seen a lot of the questions, so if you want to kind of... Yeah, I, I've seen some of them, them and, I, and I see yeah. the questions that say you can't negotiate with Putin, so I just want to address that before we um, leave. Uh, one is a, a simple answer, which is let's try, and I would like to see what happens if Biden uh, started talking to Putin. Um, the other is there have been negotiations between Ukraine and uh, Russia on the issue of getting the grain out, and those have been amazingly successful, getting over 10 million tons of grain out of Ukraine. Uh, there have been negotiations to get the International Atomic Energy Agency into uh, the Zaporizhia plant to uh, stop that from blowing up. Uh, and there have been these prisoner swaps. We heard about the high level one between uh, the Russia and the United States with Brittany Griner, but what we don't hear about and is going on quite frequently are prisoner swaps between Russia and Ukraine uh, that have been going on perhaps about twice a month for 10 months. Um, so uh, there are negotiations on some of these issues. What it has to turn into is negotiations on the broader issues of how to uh, uh, get the Russian troops out how to protect Ukraine from invasion, how to guarantee uh, that the people of the Donbass and Crimea get a, a say in their future. Uh, but all of this must happen at the peace talks. And I think uh, more and more people are realizing that now, this position that might feel like a fringe position at this moment, uh, I can guarantee that six months from now uh, will be a much more mainstream position. And so I hope that we can continue to build up this faith-based component way after Christmas, whether or not a Christmas truce uh, is possible. Uh, we need the faith-based community to be building, building, building to create this groundswell of support, um, not just in the United States, but globally for an end to this war. Absolutely. Let's end this war. And, thank you uh, so much. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. And I, I really encourage folks, there's this was such a lively chat. And this is such an important issue. Um, attend more of, of Medea's talks on this, watch the video, and be well this, this holiday season. And um, let's keep working for this Christmas truce in Ukraine and an ongoing ceasefire and end to this war. Thank you, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Peace.